If you're looking for success in the vacation rental industry, Heather Bayer and the team at CottageBlogger.com are here to show you that it's entirely within reach. Welcome to Vacation Rental Success, the show that features interviews with industry experts, successful vacation rental owners, and more, all geared toward helping you make it happen. Here's your host, Heather Bayer. Well, hello and welcome to another episode of the Vacation Rental Success Podcast. This is your host, Heather Bayer, and I'm absolutely delighted to be back with you now that I'm back in Ontario and sitting here looking out over my river, waiting for the snow to come. Apparently, the snow is going to be starting in the next day or so. So we've got fingers crossed for a white Christmas. That would be absolutely wonderful. And one of the reasons I wanted to come to Ontario to, to live here was that this guarantee of a white Christmas. You know, I'm such a kid at heart. Sadly, in the last five or six years, it's it hasn't really materialized. You know, there's been a little bit of snow on the ground. It's been huge, uh, very, very cold. But we haven't had the snow on Christmas Day that, that we used to have. But I'm keeping my fingers crossed that the snow will come this year. So my guest today is... Bob Garner, who, along with his partner, Ian, owns a property called Casal dei Fichi in Le Marquet, Italy. If you listened to episode, checking it out, episode VRS 190, when I talked to Matt Landau, when we were doing the series on on the traveling adventures of Matt, he was talking about going to Italy and as part of his trip there, he spent some time at Casal dei Fichi. That visit is shown in episode four of A Sense of Place. If you haven't come across A Sense of Place yet, I urge you to go to the show notes, check out um, episode four of A Sense of Place, which is, about, um, which is about Bob and Ian's place. But be certain to check out all the other episodes because this is Matt's amazing project where he has gone to a a variety of vacation rentals and he's recording his experiences of being a vacation rental guest. So he's, he's looking at it from that perspective, but he's also sharing the, the thoughts, the dreams, the aspirations of the owners and the managers who look after these places and the ones who are creating these unique experiences for their guests. So go check out A Sense of Place for sure. So I want to, over the course of the next couple of months, talk to many of the owners and managers who were featured on A Sense of Place and just get a little bit of a background on them and you know why they got into the business and what makes their place so unique. So Matt is telling that story and I'm just going to delve a little bit deeper to, to find out more about them. So Bob and Ian left England in 2005. They left their corporate jobs and they bought and renovated a derelict farmhouse in in an area of Italy that's not so well known as a tourist destination. So I wanted to find out from Bob what, what this was like doing this. I mean, I've watched the HGTV programs, you know, a place in the country and a place in the sun. And I wanted to, uh, to know you know, did they have those sorts of challenges, how long it took them. But I, I was also interested in how they did the research to find out whether this was going to be a viable project for them. The, the other unique thing about um, Casal de Fiki is that it, it has six apartments and Bob and Ian are on site. They're on site hosts, which is a little bit different from from what most of us are are used to. So I want to find out how that has impacted the business. You know, what does it give them an advantage over their competitors? We also talk about their environmental initiatives and how they are giving back um, to their community and also to the planet in terms of um, a project that they're involved in called Treedom. So without, without further ado, let's move on over to the interview with Bob Garner. Well, I'm delighted to have with me today Bob Garner, who 
tales from a, a small place in Italy called Le Marquet, and he has a property called Casa dei Fichi. Oh, I got that right, Bob. You did indeed. Nice <laughs> to speak to you, Heather. <laughs> yeah, well, thank you for joining me. I mean, we met so briefly in, in Florence, and, and I've been, I know I've been trying to get you on here for, for, for a while. Um, and of course, when Matt's uh, A Sense of Place episode four came out, showing you and Ian and, and the property and your guests and your perspective on vacation rentals, it made it even more important to have you on as the first of my guests from A Sense of Place. Oh, that's great. That's very kind of you. <laughs> well, let's kick off because... You've got a couple of YouTube videos. One is about the property in general, but the other was about how, how you renovated the property. And that intrigued me because like many people, I watch HGTV programs such as and BBC <laughs> programs such as, you know, a place in the country or a place in the sun or whatever they are. And, and yes. you, you see these transformations taking place. Now I've got a real live person with me. So, so who's, who's done this so I can, I can ask these questions. So let's start from the beginning. You, I mean, you and Ian were working in London. You obviously had good careers. What triggered that move to Italy? Well, you know, I think really we, we had good, good lives, good jobs, uh, a, a very uh, interesting social life in London. But we were working in corporate environments. You, you know what it's like. They work you hard. They pay you well. Um, and after a while, you end up compensating for all the work you do and the money you earn by taking lots of holidays because it makes you feel a little bit better for a short period of time. And we sort of came to the conclusion that, well, maybe if we changed our lifestyle, you know, we could be enjoying our lives all year round rather than just at certain points when we're on vacation. And so we decided, uh, having no responsibilities in terms of children, um, that we had the ability to do something different. And at that stage, we didn't know what it was. We went through a whole series of discussions about could we do this and could we do that and discounted it for one reason or another because either it was far too much hard work and wouldn't change our, our, our work-life balance or that it wouldn't create enough income for us to, to live off. Uh, and then ultimately, we came to the conclusion that what we're doing now, uh, these holiday rentals in Italy, uh, would work, could work, and we took a chance and thought we'd try and do it. So how long did it take you to find the, the right property? Well, actually, it didn't take that long at all. Um, Ian was in project management and I was in HR and change management. We're both quite sort of organised people, planners. Um, we had a very clear vision for what we wanted. We had a checklist of the sorts of things that the property had to come up to in terms of size, location, um, uh, closeness to amenities, etc. And basically, we didn't see properties that didn't meet this checklist. So actually, you know, after about 10 or 12 properties, we found the one we wanted and uh, moved forward to, to negotiate and buy it. So um, I think just a couple of visits to Italy and we were sort of on the road to our new lives. What, was Italy your first choice or were you looking in other European countries as well? No, we were looking in Italy. Um, I, I like Italy. I'd visited a lot in the past um, and uh, it's something that appealed to me in terms of its culture, its food, um, its um, environment, its people. Um, so it was definitely going to be Italy. Um, it was just where in Italy. And to be honest, we hadn't heard of Le Marquet back in 2004, 2005, until we came across it. It isn't that well known now, and it's certainly a lot less known, well known 12, 13 years ago. Uh, but once we found it and we realised how beautiful it was um, and what an opportunity it would be to get in before tourism became too big and too advanced and too specialised there, um, it, was, it was a perfect match for us. And uh, we fell in love with the place. Well, I've watched the, the video. You have a YouTube video um, called Creating Casal de Fiki. Yeah. Um, and it shows a little bit of the transformation from what, what looked like a derelict building to the mm -hmm. beautiful villa you have today. I mean, was it, was, it, was it derelict? Oh, yeah, most certainly derelict. It had been empty for 35 years. Its roof was shot. Its walls were falling down. It was basically two small farmhouses connected in a field of mud. 
Um, and then that's basically all there was with a couple of mature trees around it. So, no, it, it took a little bit of a vision to look beyond the, the wreck and see what it could be. We knew it had great potential, and so it was very exciting. Did you both have that vision of what it could be? Yes, I mean, because we talked a lot about it. We knew that we had to create a number of apartments to create enough income. We knew we had to have enough space for ourselves. We knew it had to have land that we could create private gardens for each apartment and obviously make a pool and make some um, managed grounds. So you, you have to see beyond the chaos and, the, and basically the shit and straw on the floor, which is basically what there is in an old farmhouse, and, and think about what it could be uh, when you move some walls and you, you know, open up some windows and create some light. So how, lo- how long did it take you? It took a couple of years. At the time, it was one of those um, somewhat sort of risky situations. You, you know what it's like. You have a regular income. It comes into your account each month. You live to a certain lifestyle. And then all of a sudden, the income isn't coming in, in anymore. And you have a certain window in which to finish a project before the money runs out. And so that it got to a very sort of tight point where there wasn't much money left in the bank and we had to finish the project and start to open for business. So that was a little bit hairy. Um, but in the two years, we made a lot of progress. And to be honest, there was still in that very first year, a couple of apartments behind the scenes that we were still working on superficially after we'd opened. And we had a sort of soft launch in that first year. Um, but it worked well. And uh, we've been very, very pleased with the, the life that we've now managed to create for ourselves. Well, along the way, um, you know, as I say, watching all these HGTV programs, there's always a big challenge. And usually it's with local providers and contractors. Now, with you living there, I'm guessing you, you, you became very familiar with the local people. Did you have those sorts of challenges or, or, or did you find just the right people from the very beginning? <laughs> I wish. Uh, no, no, there were definitely some challenges. Um, and, um, you know, perhaps looking back, we were uh, a little bit starry eyed about uh, what it would be like. We didn't anticipate there'd be problems, but they were certainly there. Italian bureaucracy is famous, um, and it lives up to that uh, reputation, Um, particularly in the early days when our Italian wasn't uh, fluent. uh, It it makes it even more difficult. Obviously, in those days, um, 12, 13 years ago, we were working with dial-up technology. I mean, I remember so many times standing in a field with a computer and a phone trying to use email, and that was very painful, and technology is still not brilliant in our part of, uh, of Italy. There were two challenges that we were most concerned about in terms of ourselves. Uh, Ian and I have been together for 27 years, so we were you know, very comfortable in our relationship, but we both had our own lives in London. We'd had our own careers. We had our own sets of friends. So one of the challenges would be, could we work and live together 24-7? It doesn't actually suit everybody, and that was something that we were concerned about. And the other concern that we had was as two gay men moving into a small village of a 1,000 people in rural Italy, into a Catholic community, how would we be welcomed? What would be the response? And those two things were uppermost in our minds, and actually we were very well pleased with the result in terms of we do work well together. We have our own responsibilities, but we can work 24-7 together, and, and that works for us. And actually, we've also been really welcomed by the community. We've had no discrimination or, or concerns about that, and um, our local village have been very friendly, very open, and uh, it, it's been amazing. So we've been really, really pleased with those two points. Well, I, I certainly noticed from the episode of A Sense of Place where it showed Matt and you and Ian and, and your other guests out in the village and it, it, it's clear that you are just a, a part of the fabric of that community and, and that, that was lovely to see because most, most owners don't get that. They're, 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 they're remote, they're not in there with their guests and we're, we're going to go and talk, on, uh, talk about that in a second about on-site hosting and what that, what that actually means. But I just want to sort of step back a bit and ask you about the research you did on the vacation rental market in the area before you started, because you said it, you know, it's not, I mean, even now it's still not a hot tourist region of Italy. 
And no. I'm guessing when you started that, uh, you know, you, you had to do a lot to to promote it and bring people there. But was there any market there at, at the time? There was. A, there was a limited market. And, and we did do some research, research in terms of looking at the OTAs and looking at properties, what income they could generate, generate what occupancy rates they were managing. And, you know, we did look at, you know, who would be our immediate competitors. And we also looked at that time at who were the sort of local experts that, that we might be able to draw on. Actually, we didn't find very many. Um, we did do that research. But I think also I would confess to also having done the research, we were just so enthusiastic and so sort of focused on wanting to do it. Uh, even if we'd seen some negative uh, data or information, I think we would have still pushed through and gone ahead and done it because we were trying to create a new lifestyle for ourselves. So it was extremely, and still is, extremely exciting and interesting. And sometimes the information only takes you so far and you have to go with your confidence and your, your gut instinct and take a risk sometimes um, because that's what life's about. And and. So we did, and we are very fortunate that it worked out very well for us. Yeah, it's it's that great leap of faith, isn't it? I mean, we did it years ago when we jumped across the pond and mm. and really sort of um, shut, shut everything down and left England for Canada, and that was it. We hadn't really got much of a, a, a thought of what we were going to do, except we'd bought a couple of properties in Ontario that we hoped to rent out. So I guess, yeah, we did the same thing. And I think sometimes you just have to take those chances. And I suppose we thought arrogantly that if it all went belly up, you know, worst comes to worst, we'd head back to London, we'd pick up a career somewhere or other, and, and we'd, you know, dust ourselves down and carry on. That was probably somewhat arrogant, but that's the attitude that we had. And sometimes you just have to go with uh, your gut instinct. Yeah, and you'll never know, will you, if that was arrogant or not? Yes. <laughs> With the property, you have um, six apartments. That's right. And and are they are they all similar size? Yes, um, five of the six are similar, and then there's a there's a slightly larger one, um, and each is named after a famous person from our area. So uh, they each have a name like Raffaello or Rossini or Bramante or Leopardi, for example. So famous people from Marquet. Though they're a bit like famous Belgians, there aren't that many of them. So I'm glad we only had six apartments to find names for. (laughs) Yeah, you'd be calling them Tintin. (laughs) (laughs) So you have the six apartments, but you also live there yourself. You're on site. Yes, we have a seventh apartment and we live on site. And so we, we see all our guests, we work, uh, we talk to our guests each day, we welcome them all, we say goodbye to them. You know, it's, it's our job. We don't employ staff other than cleaning staff. And so everything else is done by us. Yeah, that, uh, that, that comes, you know, the big responsibility for that because you, you have to be there all the time, I'm guessing. We are, we do. Well, we do um, in terms of, you know, we are there every evening, but it doesn't stop us going out and, and doing some other things during the day. But I think one of the decisions that we took, um, and I've, I give this advice to, to anybody who asks, because, you know, we often think we should have this T-shirt printed up with, you know, the top 20 questions that we get asked by our guests each week. Um, and one of them is, you know, why is it apartments you have and not a B&B? And the reason was that we didn't want to be too tied to the business uh, in terms of the B&B, providing breakfasts, possibly evening meals, cleaning the apartments or the rooms each day. You know, with self-contained apartments, people cater for themselves. Um, they're welcomed. Of course, we do a lot more with our guests uh, while they're with us. But in theory, you could welcome them, make sure they're content, answer all their questions and then leave them to it. Um, so it is more of a hands off relationship or it can be um and certainly we didn't want b&b for that reason we thought it was too tying the focus that you and ian have on making the guest experience really really special that comes across in just about every review i mean people aren't arriving at the place and then being left to their own devices unless they want to be Getting from these reviews that if, if they want to do their own thing and not talk to a soul, then, that, then that's what they do. But if they've got questions, if they want guidance, you are there for them um, at, at, at any time 
that they have the question. Absolutely. I mean, we've been so um, privileged to have just received our 500th um, five-star review on, on TripAdvisor. And you are right, there's a general theme that runs through them. And a lot of it is about creating that really good, excellent uh, guest experience uh, and tailoring it to the guests that we meet. So for us, we've been on several holidays, stayed in various vacation rentals and been disappointed. Uh, And in fact, now, I guess, like you and everybody else listening to this who's in the industry, when we go away, we, we can't help but analyse what works, what doesn't work, what we can take from where we're staying, what we would do differently, etc. But when we, we took all that information and all that, that thinking and tried to put that into our business. Now, we make mistakes. We've made lots of mistakes. But um, what we try to do is focus on what the guest would like and how we can best provide it. We're people, people, I suppose, at the end of the day. And for us, it, it doesn't feel like we have to think it through as a process, a linear process in steps A, B, C, et cetera. It it sort of comes naturally from conversations with the guests, getting to know them, um, finding a little bit about what they're interested in doing and and helping them achieve that. Uh, And that might be lying by the pool each week, being left alone to read a book, and um, that's fine. Or sometimes it might be about guests wanting to travel around and see various villages to, you know, take in an experience that might be truffle hunting or, or making some pottery or whatever it might be. The secret for us seems to be in trying to get close to the guest if they're comfortable with that and, and helping them have a good time, which is about asking the right questions and then listening really carefully to the answers. Um, and for us, that's what we do. But we, we try to be present, but not intrusive. And because we're on site, we get lots of opportunities to talk to the guests. They're often sitting in, each, in, in their private gardens. As we pass by, we can open up a conversation and see where it goes. And if it doesn't go anywhere, we leave them in peace. And you soon get a feel for the sort of people they are and what they're looking for. And then we try and give it to them. And we get, to be honest, it's quite a selfish thing. We we get a big buzz out of that. We get a lot of pleasure about seeing people have a great time. And one thing that I say often is working in corporates as we did, one often didn't get thank you. We get a virtual or a physical pat on the back by six sets of guests each week saying, thank you very much. You've helped me have a lovely holiday. Now, how fantastic is that? I mean, that is such a buzz for us. And it sounds a little corny, but we genuinely enjoy that experience. So it, it's it's selfish as well as generous, if I can put it that way. Well, I think, you know, it, it, it's the one thing that uh, I think everybody in this business loves. They, they, they like that pat on the back, whether it's whether you're actually talking to somebody face to face or whether it's that review that you get. It's that knowledge that you've you've done it right. You've you've given them an experience and given them memories, which I think is, you know, that's why we're all in this business is to, is to help people create their, their, their memories and their dreams. Yeah. And of course we, we do get an opportunity because we create a, um, a pizza party um, at the beginning of each week where we have a, an original brick, large pizza oven in the garden. Um, it's about a hundred years old, I guess. And we make the dough, we bring all the ingredients, we bring the wine and the drinks, and we ask all the guests to join us. And each person takes it in turn to roll out and make their own pizza, put it in the oven, share it with their fellow guests. And so it goes on through the evening. And that's a great way of breaking down the barriers a little bit and people getting to know not only us and uh, us them, but the other fellow guests as well. And we really notice the difference in attitude and in atmosphere the next day after the pizza party as people are saying hello to each other and using first names and chatting by the pool and becoming friends and going off eating together to to do an event or some activity. And so for us, that feels like a a good sort of icebreaker um, and really gets people talking uh, and, and interacting. And so that's something that we can do because we're on site. 
Yeah, I love that. And so many of your reviews mention the Monday night pizza party. Yes. And, <laughs> and, and so many of them say, you know, that they met people that are now friends, friends for life. The other thing I noticed is that so many of the reviews say, I'm here, you know, I, this is my fifth time, my sixth time. Um, yes. What's the most times that one of your guests has come back? Um, well, I suppose it's about 12, 12 or 13 <laughs> it would be now. Um, but it's not uncommon. We have a lot of guests who come back every year, uh, so five, six, seven times. You know, um, usually before they leave, um, they have a preferred apartment. All the apartments, although they have the same fittings and, and fixtures, they each have a different aspect, a different way of looking out into the environment because we were constrained by some of the physical structural walls. Um, so some people have a preference for this apartment or that apartment, and they have a preferred week. So before they leave, they say, oh, well, can we have the same apartment for this time next year? Uh, and of course, of course, we, we try and fit them in. And so we're very fortunate that we get, I think this year it was 55% of our guests had previously stayed with us. So um, that's, that's a great plus because we don't have to work at it. We know them, they know us, they're less stressed before they arrive because they know what they're coming into and, and we know them. And so many of them have become friends now and we, we see them socially when we're in the UK. So they're, not, they're no longer guests, they're now friends, but it's still lovely. Yeah, I, now I, I, I appreciate why you're loving this life so much. <laughs> Bob, let's talk about your marketing. Um, you know, when you when 2005 was around about the time that HomeAway started, um, Airbnb wasn't really on the cards at that time. Tell me what, what your marketing was like when you started, where you where you were listing, and what's working for you now. Well, the first thing that did before we left the UK, um, well, actually before that, before we'd even opened for business, we visited <clears throat> the property and picked our olives, which you do in the November. And um, we had them pressed, and we took this olive oil back to the UK. We then went on a, a two-month tour of the UK, staying with various friends uh, on their sofa bed or on their spare bed or wherever, and did a tour of uh, lots of our friends all over the UK, gave them a bottle of this olive oil with a personalised label with their name on uh, and a little bit of information about the olive oil. And we said, why don't you come and see us? Um, we have to charge you. It's our business. But we'll give you a good discount. And that will be a little bit of a soft launch. You'll help us. You'll have a nice holiday. Um, and we obviously want to keep in touch. So in our first year, we had, I think, maybe 20-odd friends came and visited, which obviously helped us considerably to get our business started. And they told their friends and family. And, and so that grew. Um, and so that was a good start for us. But also in that very first year, we used a couple of small agencies. And at the time, they were charging 25% commission introduction, which was, you know, horrendous. But we thought, we've got to get some bumps on seats. We've got to get some people through the door. We'll take that hit um, and until we've got started. And then we can be a bit more... Um, judicious about where we get our introductions from. So that first year worked really um, quite well. Um, we also did some press work and got some very nice articles in that first and second year. And that really did generate quite a lot of interest for us. And then after that, we could be a lot more selective about where we took our, uh, our introductions from. So, so you say you did some press work. Um, I've always been taken with the story that Antonio Bortolotti tells about his property and getting some really valuable um, editorial in a magazine and that mm. that sort of kicked his business off and many years later he still uses that as part of his marketing strategy his his promotional stuff always <laughs> mentions this article how, how did you get that press interest because i i know you know from from my experience with with the british travel press they are look. They do look for um, for something out of the ordinary, something unique. Is is that where you where you kicked off? I, I don't know if we were just lucky. Uh, I did have some a little bit of previous experience of, of writing press releases. Um, we sent it out to so many um, press contacts that we could discover or knew in the UK, because mainly in the first couple of years, most of our business came from the UK. 
now it's about 50%. Um, and, you know, maybe we just hit lucky. I don't know. We got um, the Guardian and the Observer, which you'll know from the UK, um, and they uh, both ran pieces for us. They're both under the same stable. Um, and even now we get people who come come to us and we say, how did you find us? And they said, well, we've kept this clipping all these years, <laughs> 10 years, and they've, they've still got this clipping in the folder somewhere. So you never know with these things. They do have a, a longer life than you imagine. Yeah, talking to um, Jessica Gillingham from uh, Abode PR. Um, did you come across mm. Jessica? She is a specialist in vacation rental PR. And and really, that whole idea of of pitching to the press hasn't changed a lot in in the in the last ten twelve years. Um, and you can still do exactly the same and pitch to these uh, to to travel writers. Um, and you know, it, it, there there is always a chance that that will work, and it's so valuable. <laughs> Absolutely. It's an amazing opportunity. I have to say, though, in all fairness, you know, we've done it on several occasions and got nothing. So sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. And I, I, I can't actually identify what the reason for that is, because sometimes we've pitched something. We think, ah, oh, this is amazing. They're definitely going to want this. And they're not interested at all. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. Over the years, we've managed to accumulate some press perhaps by luck or good fortune, I don't know. But um, when it comes, especially in the broad sheets and you get a big article, it really makes a fantastic difference. Yes, and, and as you say, you, people, people do clip those articles still they and do. hold on to them. Or, or, or you know, now, of course, they, they will go onto the website and then bookmark it. So let, let's yes. talk, talk about websites. You've got a great website. I love it. Well, what's your percentage of direct bookings through your website as opposed to what you're getting from the OTAs now? Our main business is, is through returns, so that's about 55%. We get about another 20% from referrals, which is uh, obviously from people who've previously stayed and recommended us to friends and family. We get uh, the rest, so there's you know another 30-odd um, another percent, um, which are 25%, in fact, which is coming from the website and OTAs. So we probably get about 10 bookings a year through OTAs, um, and then the rest is our website or as I say, referrals or, 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 or uh, repeats. So for us, the OTAs are not a big thing. Um, and for, in all fairness, you know, the, the only reason we continue to, uh, to stay with uh, TripAdvisor is because we don't want to lose all those wonderful reviews, although we have captured them on our uh, internal systems. But it's nice to have them up there for people to see. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's, an, that's a really important point to make, that, uh, that your reviews, that reviews on the OTAs do not belong to you. They belong to them. Um, Absolutely. We, we lost 550 reviews when we uh, fell out with TripAdvisor. I was just about to say, Heather, I remember your personal painful experience, <laughs> and I learned a lesson from that. Now, we, every, every time we get a review, it's, it's a copy and paste, and we put it away somewhere nice and safe, just in case. Yeah. It was amazing, actually. I, last year, we just paid um, a guy somewhere in India, you know, like I think $30, and uh, he uploaded our 400 and odd reviews at that point onto a spreadsheet for us, you know, through Upwork. It was just it's so easy, no hassle, and uh, it's amazing just to be sure and safe that you've always got those. That's, that is a great tip because um, I think, I think um, you know, certainly for somebody in, in your position, because you, you're getting a lot of reviews because you've got six units. So probably you're getting many more than, than most people who just got one property. Um, yes. But even so, even so, if, if you haven't done it for a few years, <laughs> then it definitely is time to, to do that. And Upwork is, as you say, a great um, resource to find somebody that you can just task to go and do that. And, and it's, it's, it's an inexpensive way of, of securing all that valuable information. Absolutely. And, and, and you know, on, on work generally, we found so many skilled people who've helped us because we have quite a lot of gaps in our experience and knowledge. And why not just outsource it to somebody else? Mm -hmm. Give them the business. It doesn't change cost a great deal and they do a fantastic job yeah yeah absolutely tell me about your website did you did you do that yourselves did you um did you have a company do it for you um it's the third iteration for us it's it's a wordpress website and we had uh, somebody do it for us uh, we maintain it ourselves now unless it gets very technical 
Um, and uh, so we're constantly tweaking and changing it. Um, but we're quite pleased with it. There's still more to do, but there's always more to do. Um, with 55% of your guests um, as returns, are there any secrets to getting people to come back? I think we're on site. Clearly, that makes a difference. That personal relationship, that connection to those people is obviously going to be so much more difficult if you're remote from your location that you're renting. Um, for us, building that relationship, maintaining that relationship, even when they're not physically in front of us, is also important. You know, keeping in contact by email, um, even when you're not trying to sell them anything or ask them anything, but just keeping up that relationship. Um, we were amazed at the number of people who, who, who write to us to tell us they've had a grandchild or unfortunately that their husband or wife has died or they're getting divorced or, you know, we, we feel like we're sort of in their lives a little bit and it's, it's very touching and very nice. And, um, but it, it comes from obviously trying to maintain a relationship and I wouldn't always say friend because that would be inappropriate if you don't know them that well. But we we try to sort of have a sense of how comfortable they are getting to know us. Um, and if they are, then we want to get to know them then because we've met such amazing people um, over the years. It's been incredible. We do have two little rules that we apply. One is that we never ask anybody what their job is. We always think they're on holiday, they've come away, and their men don't want to talk about it. If it comes up in conversation, that's fine, but we never ask. Um, and the second thing is that we have certain boundaries. Obviously, we're respectful and, and treat people appropriately. But, for instance, we would never use the swimming pool when there were any guests on site because it's their pool, that they've paid good money to use that pool with the fellow guests. So when they're on site, it's their pool, which is very uh, frustrating sometimes when it's <laughs> 40 degrees and you'd love to have a little dip. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I can imagine that. I saw that you were, you get up very, very early in the morning. Yeah, well, I try to. I, I'm the one, I look after the gardens and the grounds. So, uh, yeah, you have to get an early start. Yeah, get up early in the morning, have your swim before anybody else gets up. <laughs> <laughs> I want to talk about your environmental initiatives um, because that's something that came out of um, of a sense of place again. It's something that Matt said, and and I think that this was was linked in with something that you did environmentally. He said, "I left Le Marquet with a newfound appreciation for how the personality of an individual can really play a big role in a vacation rental business success." These small gestures begin to rub off on you as a guest. It's almost like their small business was making me a better version of myself. And I think when he's talking about these small gestures, it came in the episode after, I, th I think um, you were talking about not using plastic water bottles. Give me some ideas of, of what you're doing in, environmentally to, to maintain a, you know, a green element to your business. Well, it, it was really generous of, of Matt to say that, and uh, it's uh, typical of his personality and his style, so uh, I want to acknowledge that. Um, yeah, for us, the environment is, is really important, and we'll, you'll find it all across our website in, in subtle ways, but we do have a page on our website all about our initiatives. Obviously, there's a lot of the routine ones that you'd expect us to be doing, um, so I won't go through those, but you know, we'll do things like we've got uh, charges for electric cars. Um, we've obviously got solar panels. Um, but it's things that are sort of smaller but represent uh, the bigger issue. So, for instance, our guests are provided with uh, recycled toilet paper, which might not sound very appealing, but I guarantee that it's good paper and very, very soft on the skin. But that means that those the profits from that company, it's called Who Gives a Crap, actually, which is quite <laughs> funny. Uh, <laughs> Um, Fifty percent of the profits of that company go to building toilets in the third world because there's something um, like I think we've got the number 
several billion people in the third world who do not have regular access to a toilet. Um, and so, you know, a small thing like, you know, providing paper uh, from a business that plows its profit back into into providing toilets is, has got to be a, a good thing in, in our view. You know, things like plastic. We, we try to discourage people, and we're going to be doing some more next year, from um, from buying plastic, uh, water in plastic bottles. Um, and we, we provide an alternative. But even things like um, the household products and the cosmetics and the soaps, et cetera, that people use, you know, we know we're starting to learn as a society that plastic is such an insidious product that it's actually polluting the planet. So why buy a product with some hand washing? You finish the hand wash, you throw the plastic bottle away. So we use a company called Splosh, and you keep the same bottle, and they send you a small packet of substance that you rehydrate, put, in, put into that bottle, and you continue to use that bottle all year round. Um, and there's less carbon uh, in the transportation of that product. So those small little things make um, a difference when they build up. Uh, and if everybody was taking a couple of steps forward, it could make a big difference. Um, but the, the scheme that um, that um, we're most proud of, which we started last year, was our, our Treedom scheme. Um, and this came about because we'd built a relationship with a lot of restaurants nearby. Um, it's, the food in Italy is wonderful. Our guests love to, to go out and dine regularly for lunch or dinner. Um, so we've sent a lot of business to these restaurants over the years and been very happy to do so because they're fantastic. Um, but we've never monetized that relationship. And I'm not talking about a payback for us. I'm talking about for, for some other means. So we decided to introduce this, this scheme where guests dine at a restaurant. They get a discount from that restaurant of, say, 10%. They bring that discount back to us and we give them all the, the literature and the means to do that. And they leave that in a branded envelope um, in their apartment. We then add our contribution to that. And then those monies um, are passed on to a company called Treedom. And they plant trees with that money because trees are absorbing carbon dioxide. They're giving out oxygen. They're giving um, a business to subsistence farmers. And, and so it's a virtual circle. Um, it hasn't been paid for by the guest and it hasn't been um, paid for by anybody else except the restaurants and ourselves. So the guest goes away feeling that they've made a contribution to the environment simply by doing what they were going to do in the first place, going out to eat. Um, and so they start to feel better about themselves. And we can start to, in a very subtle and gentle way, educate them so that they go home thinking that perhaps they can take the next step to being slightly greener. Of course, what's most important is that's not done in a cajoling or preaching um, or lecturing, hectoring way. It has to be done through conversations bubbling up when they ask us about these things. And then we try to lead them in a certain way to think about what they may be able to do when they go home. Um, and that's what we love because these small things, if they're multiplied up, can make a really big difference to the environment. So for us, it's it's a, a crucial part of who we are, um, and we feel that we're starting to make some progress in that area, though there are a lot more steps that we need to take too. Mm -hmm. um, the Treedom, Treedom website is great, and I'll be putting a link to that in the uh, in the show notes. So if anybody wants to go and take yes, a look at it, freedom.net then uh, it will be there that, that's fantastic bob Great. i'd love to hear and i know matt does it's um very much a, a part of his philosophy about giving back and and how we as vacation rental owners and businesses can can give back either to our local communities or or you know to, to the to the wider community so this is a, a great initiative and and people i i think are, are very happy to take part in these initiatives they don't have to think about it it's sort of fed to them in a in a very um respectful manner and and they can take part as and when they want but in the end they are contributing which is wonderful absolutely and in fact um i would just mention that matt and i are working on another initiative called the star throwers which i think you may be aware of heather uh, where we're trying to collect best practice and um, examples of vacation rental owners or 
um, uh, managers who are doing something for their community. And we're trying to build a collective um, of those people and put those examples up so that we can share them and people can copy them um, or learn from them. Um, and so I'd be interested if anybody listening who's in the vacation rental business and is doing something um, altruistic in their own community, we'd be really interested to hear from them. So contact me or, or contact Matt. Okay, and I will uh, I will put out um, information on how to contact you and Matt in the show notes as well about that. That's fantastic, Bob. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Thank you. What, what what about your business? Do you find the most challenging? <laughs> For me, it, um, I have to say in all honesty, it's it's switching off. Um, I love it, um, and I find it quite addictive. Um, but I'm not the best at switching off. We do have a sort of policy in and I that twice a week we go off to the beach and we relax at the beach because if we were there, however much we wanted to distance ourselves, there's always things to do. There's always um, activities to, to plan. There's always work on the website or on marketing. The only way that I find I'm able to, to, to switch off is to physically be removed from the location. Um, and so for me, the biggest challenge is switching off and, uh, and getting away and, and not thinking of those things. Um, but I, I actually love doing what I do. So um, it doesn't feel like a chore at all when doing it. Yeah, that, that's the best bit, isn't it? When, uh, <laughs> when you wake up every morning and you can't wait to get at it. <laughs> Well, we have this crazy thing is I'm always coming up with these really harebrained schemes. And I'll, I'll say to Ian, well, I've just thought about this. And this is how I see it working. And what do you think about that? And Ian is the sort of sounding board, the, the logic person. He'll say, hmm, no, I don't think that's going to work. Or, yeah, but if we tweak it in this way, maybe it would be more effective. So, um, you know, maybe three times out of ten, I get a, a thumbs up. And the rest is, no, good try, but I'm not sure that's <laughs> That's appropriate. Yeah, <laughs> You've got to have these brainstorms to get anywhere. It sounds like me and my business partner, his, the, 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 the words that he hates coming out of my mouth is, I've got an idea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly right. But, yep. you know, sometimes they, flat, they fly and that's brilliant when they do. Absolutely, absolutely. So if you were to talk to someone today who wanted to start a similar business, who's listening to this and thinking, oh, I do you know, I can do this. Bob and Ian have done it. I can go do this. What tips would you give them? Well, yes. Um, we get a lot of our guests uh, who want to do what we do. Um, we've had so many conversations with them about, oh, we'd love to do what you do. It's a wonderful life. And of course, they don't see the work that goes on behind the scenes, but I can understand why they feel that. Um, and so it's something that crops up a lot. We would always say, know the market, understand the market and how it's changing. We know how the OTA landscape is changing, and it's going to change a lot more in the future. And there are a lot of risks attached to that. So people need to have a really good understanding, as best as one can, of where this market is going. And, and locally, who are the competitors, how it would work, um, and if you could make a business out of um, out of a new project. Um, I would also say, if you can get into a business, even if you're volunteering or a placement or some way of getting in and seeing if it's for you, because this role that we have d wouldn't suit everybody. I love it. You love it. Many of people listening to this love it, but a lot of people perhaps wouldn't. And so, you know, before you leap into something and give up your own life, maybe for some people it is worth trying it out and seeing if it's the, the sort of lifestyle they feel comfortable with. That is great uh, advice. I, I, I know every, everywhere I go on, on vacation, I, I just think, ah, I've got to buy something here. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, it's another version of I've got an idea. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, we, we get a lot of guests who say to us, well, why don't you open up Casal de Fiki 2? Because when we're full, we're full. And we say, well, no, because we came here for a lifestyle change. We came here to enjoy what we're doing, to make enough money to live the life we want to lead, but also to have a much better work-life balance or harmony. 
And if we opened up a new business, then we'd be getting sucked into a bigger thing than we actually want. So what works for us is that we have the balance and we don't, we don't always get it right, but we, mainly we have a good balance and uh, we enjoy what we do. So this is big enough for us. Well, it sounds like you you are super successful at this and your guests absolutely love it. And you have the life that you were looking for way back in 2005. Absolutely. <laughs> Bob, thank you so much for, for joining me. It was an absolute pleasure to talk to you. I mean, Italy has always been my favorite place. Uh, when we lived in England, we, we would go to Italy every single year um, mm. around the Lake Como area. I have this urge to go back again. I, when I was in Florence, I was talking to Debbie Heatert, who, of course, came and stayed with you during her trip to, to Italy and went out to lunch with her one day. And she was just, well, she couldn't stop talking about how wonderful it, uh, it was. One day. <laughs> I will do well, that. Well, you'd be very welcome at any time. But come in the summer when it's warm. Oh, absolutely. Yes. Well, in fact, you're not there in the winter anyway. <laughs> We're not, no. <laughs> That's when we go on our holiday. Yeah. So, well, in, enjoy, enjoy your holiday. Enjoy the rest of your time in London and wherever else you're going to do before your season starts again. And, uh, and I hope we catch up again at some point in the future. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure to talk to you. What a lovely person Bob is. And I, after talking to him, I'm sort of envisaging this absolutely idyllic lifestyle that, uh, that Bob and Ian have with their wonderful property, gorgeous gardens, happy, happy guests, friendly locals, and the most stunning scenery. And then uh, after we finished the interview and I was talking to Bob about, you know, what do you do? in the low season because they shut the, uh, the accommodation down um, from November through to April um, because there just isn't demand for Italy in the winter. So he's in London at the moment and then heading off to the Far East in January, February on, on an extended trip. And I thought, this, this definitely beats corporate London life. I can absolutely see why they jettisoned their career paths and uh, and moved to Italy. Anyway, perfect to talk to Bob. Um, or as always, all the links, all the things we mentioned, all those links will be shown in the show notes. Uh, you can go and check out the Treedom website. You can check out the website for Who Gives a Crap and Splosh and everything else that we mentioned. And I'll put um, Bob's email address so you can contact him directly if you want to share what you do to give back to your local community or, um, you know, any wider project that your vacation rental business contributes to because star throwers want to hear about it. So I'll put that information on there as well. And of course, you know, if you've got any general comments, if you've got questions, questions for Bob, you know, how do you do this? How can I do this? Then put them on the show notes, uh, put them in the comments after the show notes and Bob will be sure to get back to you and uh, perhaps guide you in the right direction of making your own escape. So I hope you enjoyed that. It was uh, it was an absolute delight for me to to finally connect with with Bob and hear hear the story. Um, it's a it's a really great one. Thank you so much for listening this week, and I will be with you again very shortly. This episode of Vacation Rental Success is over, but don't worry, Heather will be back soon. Want more great resources? Visit cottageblogger.com for tips, tricks, downloads, and strategies to help you achieve profit from your vacation rental business.